We'll begin the fireside chat now. Uh, with me here is uh, Mr. Ashwin Ramanathan, a senior partner with AZB and Partners. Uh, he's also the lead restructuring partner for AZB. As you all know, AZB has been involved uh, with the IBC framework right from the beginning. They were one of the lawyers who helped draft the policy and uh, came up with the law. Uh, one of the participants who uh, helped draft the law, rather. And uh, they've, over the last two years, they've been advising various stakeholders. Uh, I'll let Ashwin tell you all who, you know, who they've advised and uh, how the experience has been. But I, I just thought I'd mention that you know, they are also the advisor to the RBI. Uh, so recently, when Videocon Industries and SR Steel uh, took the regulator to the court, uh, AZB was one of the uh, AZB was the counsel for them. Uh, so today we're going to discuss how uh, the, NC, the IBC process has been, uh, whether the existing norms are on the right path, and whether we can use this opportunity to trigger deep-rooted reforms uh, within the banking system. Uh, so thank you, Ashwin. Thank you for being here. Uh, do you want to start with uh, you know, one of the fund managers that I met uh, last month, he referred to the IBC process, the NCLT process, as the wild, wild west. Um, what has your experience been? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ranjani. Um, and, and thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and address this very well-attended event. So congrats on that, first of all. Um, <laughs> in relation to the IBC process being the wild, wild west, um, I, I can see why somebody might say that. Uh, I think, though, it's important also to just keep all of this discussion in context. And the context being that, you know, we are as large a country as we are. Uh, we are a democracy. Um, we are notoriously, um, you know, subject to a judicial system which is overloaded uh, with cases. So that's the background and that's a backdrop against which uh, we are all trying to judge, if you like, uh, a new legislative process uh, which aims to do a lot of things. Uh, but in, principally, it aims to change mindsets almost completely. Um, you know, I, I joined uh, the workforce in, in, in 2000. Um, and at the time, and, and I joined, my, my, my career started with a bank. And at the time that I joined, I mean, it was pretty much said as not so funny a joke within the bank that, you know, you know, a, a borrower has an option to repay. They don't really have an obligation to repay. Um, to turn that kind of a mindset uh, in less than two decades from then, and literally in, in a space of less than two years from now, uh, looking back when we talk about the IBC having come in, is, is a phenomenal sort of task. Um, and to that end, I think uh, certainly uh, the right steps, the right first steps have been taken. Uh, the reason I mentioned all of that around sort of context and background is also that, look, this is a new statute. Um, aspects of it are new to everybody. Uh, so literally, the entire system, the financial system in India, if you like, has been on the learn. Um, and this means the banks have been learning things. Uh, banks, in their capacity as committee of creditor lenders, have been learning things. It's created a whole new breed of professionals called resolution professionals. They have been learning new things. Uh, the lawyers have been playing catch up. Um, the NCLT, which is a new tribunal that is specially constituted to, you know, address IBC-related cases, they are learning things. So it necessarily is a learning process, um, and this means that, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, mistakes will be made, uh, mistakes will be rectified, positions will be taken, positions may be uh, found to be, you know, unjust at some point of time, and therefore positions might be reversed. Um, and, and to me, focusing on sort of these kinds of problems is really missing the forest for the trees. Uh, because, uh, you know, these are, these are, okay, so these are issues that need to be gone through. Uh, but it doesn't mean that overall the process is not successful or overall the process will not be successful. I think, if anything, we have seen definite demonstration of intent um, and, and, and concerted effort from the government, from the regulators, from the banks uh, to try and make this work. 
And the size of the problem, the NPA situation in the country is la as large as it is. I don't think there's a choice but to, you know, uh, make this work. So, after, you know, having said all of that, I think the brief answer is yes. I mean, you know, it may seem like things are unclear, but I think that is inevitable. Um, it is also, I think, a necessary part of the process of establishing something that is so new, so radical. Um, and the fact that there are flips and flops on policies and, change, and changes in decisions, overall, I think, will lead in the longer term to a much stronger, a much more robust process. Right. Right. You make a good point. Uh, you know, not, not to be negative as such, but w what, in your opinion, what, what are the positive changes, behavioral changes that have happened uh, in the last one year? So, um, so interestingly, I mean, uh, and again, you know, all of these are not necessarily numbers that are widely reported, but as I understand it, something like 20 to 30,000 crores of uh, bad debt have been resolved pre-IBC. And these are all companies that would eventually have come up on the list to be taken into the IBC by banks. Um, but then the promoters realized that, you know, this is, this is, the, this is the cliff that they're staring at that they need to do something to address the situation early. They came to banks voluntarily with one-time settlement proposals. 20 to 30,000 crores of promoters voluntarily trying to settle debt is, is, is pretty significant for India. Um, again, compared to the background that, uh, you know, nobody used to actually ever repay debt. Um, so I think that's, that's one definite positive change that has happened. Two, uh, the regulator, and this is starting from, uh, you know, I think Dr. Rajan's time, who really sort of focused uh, all of the country's attention, if you like, on the NPA situation, on the fact that, you know, bank balance sheets weren't as robust as they might have appeared to be. Um, his insistence pretty much on trying to recognize stress early and trying to do something early in order to address that stress. I think what that has also done is changed, led to a change in the mindset of banks. You see, from, from the last sort of financial crisis, which is around 2000 or so, in the following on the, on the back of the dot-com bust, uh, Indian banks had gotten into this, um, uh, into this rut, I would say, of basically postponing the problem. So you had the CDR, which was by all accounts a fantastic, uh, you know, resolution, mod uh, model of resolution. But in essence, and, and, you know, lawyers that have worked on CDRs and professionals that have worked on CDRs uh, will know what I'm saying when I say this. Every CDR scheme looked identical to every other CDR scheme, by which I mean that regardless of the industry, regardless of the sector, regardless of prospects, regardless of customers, diversification, concentration, whatever, every CDR proposal pretty much had exactly the same elements. A certain amount of debt would be converted into equity, a certain amount of debt would be, you know, converted into a funded interest term loan, and all of that would be restructured to be repaid, you know, eight years, ten years down the line. It worked, by the way. The reason it worked is you, the CDR mechanism came into play and was in effect through a phase when India was seeing a 10% year-on-year GDP growth. So the easing up of, cash, of pressure on cash flows in terms of, um, you know, uh, companies being allowed to take more time to repay debt actually allowed them to grow their business, grow their cash flows, and actually come out of a distressed situation. Um, when you don't have that kind of uh, growth rate backing you, I think then you realize that just kicking the can down the road is not something that's necessarily going to be helpful. So to me, I think that's the second big change that has come. So one, promoters have basically started coming forward, becoming more responsible about repaying debt. Uh, whether you attribute this to noble intentions or just the realization of the fact that once it goes into IBC, it's very likely that they will end up losing their company altogether. Uh, the point is it has caused that behavioral change. The second point is, uh, the second important point from my perspective at least, is that banks have realized that, you know, postponing the problem only creates a bigger problem down the road. And so there is definitely uh, a focus on trying to resolve the problem today rather than, uh, you know, postponing it. Right. Are, are banks able to uh, predict the problem in advance? In, I mean... Um, I think that's a harder question. Um, see, that comes down, I think, to post disbursement, um, can I say post disbursement uh, rigors and post disbursement um, compliances. So really, does the bank do enough by way of monitoring sort of cases, uh, you know, where they've given away money? Bank documentation, by the way, has always been top class. It doesn't matter which bank we're talking about in India, the documents basically give the banks tremendous amounts of rights. I think the real question is to what extent have those rights ever been exercised? 
Uh, every document, bank lending document that I have seen allows banks the right to, you know, examine books and assets and inventory and, you know, things like that for companies. Um, I don't know how often that is done. I'd be delighted if, you know, uh, uh, banks tell me that they do do it on a regular basis. I suspect it's not anywhere near as regular as it could be. So I think credit, post-credit uh, disbursement discipline is something that needs to come in. I don't think that is there to the extent that it could be there. Uh, by contrast, I'll tell you something, I mean, you know, and there are a lot of NBFCs in the audience today as well. Um, I've seen NBFCs basically do this with a lot more rigor, a lot more discipline, particularly around things like financial governance, particularly around things like, you know, sufficiency of assets, uh, checking on, you know, the ability to repay, free cash flows. You know, all of these things, I think, are not necessarily intrinsically baked into the actual systems that banks end up following. And so I think that probably hinders the ability to recognize signs of stress early. The one set of people that do recognize signs of stress early, though, are the promoters. And we are seeing the promoters actually now, because of the backdrop of the IBC and because of perhaps an unexpected fallout of Section 29A, which basically prevents promoters from bidding for their own assets. Um, I think what we're seeing is NBFC, uh, NBFCs are being reached out to by these promoters in advance of distress to say, well, you know, uh, 300 crores today can save us all a whole lot of problems and that 300 crores will basically buy me the six months that I basically need to turn things around and uh, you know they borrow at a higher rate of interest for sure the NBFCs are taking greater risk for sure uh, but then you know I can see that the NBFCs basically take that risk but they take it with open eyes and they make sure that they have some kind of security that they're able to liquidate so I think the ability to identify um, uh, early signs of trouble certainly exists. I think the source is somewhat unexpected in that it's promoters. I think the reason and the motivations for identifying the risk early is also somewhat different from what might normally be expected. It's not banks doing it. It's the promoters themselves doing it, but then reaching out to a particular set of uh, uh, lenders that can help alleviate the problem. The NBFC bit is a... Is interesting because over the last five years we've seen that MB NBFCs have actually grown more than the banks and you're saying that they have a better ability to identify risks in advance. Why is that? Uh, so one is the reason that I just mentioned. I mean, I think these opportunities simply do come to them. Uh, they are more flexible in terms of who they're able to lend to, um, you know, and they're not subject to the same kinds of rigors that uh, banks are. Um, I think the other aspect of this is you're seeing the kind of growth for NB. Okay, see, here's some numbers that you know I just heard recently: 26 public sector banks in the country, 16 of which are under PCA, uh, which means that they can't lend except to AAA rated borrowers. Of the remaining 10, six are almost there, which means even those six are not lending to anybody except AAA rated borrowers. That leaves you with four public sector banks that basically constitute about 80 percent of the total credit in the country for public sector banks that can lend to the rest of the country. Um, so credit offtake from banks is an all-time low. Just given the state of the balance sheets, it doesn't look like it's going to start growing in a hurry. Um, the private sector do, banks are doing what they can, but they're also, you know, grappling to a certain extent with the NPA situation themselves, which is why I think NBFCs have very neatly stepped into that space. Um, and I think over the last maybe 10 years or so, um, the RBI's own view of NBFCs, I think, has undergone a radical change. So RBI used to view NBFCs with a lot of suspicion. They used to be quite uncomfortable with NBFCs doing a whole lot of business. But the moment the RBI came out with this whole notion of systemically important NBFCs, the fact that they have to be regulated prudentially, and the moment the RBI became comfortable that they had the right regulations in place to allow NBFCs to operate within a system that still managed risks for the system as a whole, I think the RBI's own skepticism around NBFCs has, has undergone quite a big change as well. And so the RBI is now in a position where they're actually encouraging NBFCs, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 um, uh, to, to provide credit to the industry. Um, and I think that's a space that the NBFCs have stepped into quite nicely. Um, I was just having a discussion with somebody uh, during the break. You know, MFIs, microfinance institutions kind of did that for the low end of credit for many, many years now. I think you've started seeing that move up the value chain through technology, uh, but you have intermediaries that basically now organize a whole lot of retail and commercial banks, uh, retail and commercial loans for banks. Um, and, and I think that piece of the value chain is likely to continue to move up, enabled by technology, no doubt. 
uh, but uh, also enabled by, techno um, by, by transparency, also enabled by corporate regulation that just basically gives, uh, you know, third parties a more comfortable view of, you know, a corporate's finances. So once third parties have a better ability to assess what a corporate is all about, I think through technology and through intermediaries or NBFCs, you'll start seeing movement of credit outside of the purview or the, outside of the exclusive purview, I'd say, of banks and more sort of shared with the NBFCs as well. Uh, I just want to bring in a bit about the RBI. Um, you mentioned uh, RBI is more like uh, keen on NBFCs lending um, and stepping into the space. Uh, can, can you give us a broader view of what the regulator is thinking right now uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, recent... Re yesterday, for instance, uh, we had the uh, deadline for the Feb 12 circular. Um, going forward, how is the regulator uh, looking at, you know, are, are they likely to come up with more uh, such circulars uh, to, you know, streamline, tighten the framework? Yeah, so look, I mean, I think all of the focus, uh, if you're honest, I mean, I think all of the focus around the IBC, all of the attention it has received, everything that it has achieved, you know, despite all the criticism of the things that it may not have achieved or the failures and uh, bad decisions, etc., if you just consider what it has actually achieved and what it has actually enabled in terms of a discussion, in terms of a narrative, uh, it wouldn't really have been possible unless the RBI had first instructed the banks to take those first 12 companies, the so-called dirty dozen, uh, into the IBC. Now, the R RBI, it's not the RBI's job, literally, I don't think, it's anybody's view that it's the RBI's job to tell banks what to do with respect to their distressed assets. But if you have a look at what the RBI has been doing over the last five years, it is pretty much exactly that. Um, I think, um, you know, so, so first the circular that required, you know, the top 12 cases to be taken into the IBC kind of forced a whole lot of attention on the IBC process. Um, I think it was necessary, I think it was important, because the banks by themselves had started taking cases to the IBC, but they were all small cases. They were for the most part test cases for the banks. They said, well, you know, we have a bunch of different NPAs, here's a new route that everybody says might be helpful, let's try it out with this small company that we don't really care about. Uh, but taking in something that is large, substantial, has meaningful stakes, uh, stakeholders and stakes involved for everybody uh, was a whole sea change and would never have happened, frankly, in my view, at least, unless the RBI had forced it. Uh, once the RBI did that, I think, it, you know, then the RBI came out with the next list of 28, and then you had the circular, the Feb 12th, infamous Feb 12th circular, for which the deadline ran out yesterday. Um, will the RBI do more than this? I, I, I think that, you know, the jury's out on that, and we will see. I think very much depends upon how much is achieved out of what the RBI has already done. Um, I think it already accounts for a very significant uh, proportion of the NPAs. Um, there is currently a discussion and in fact a dispute uh, going on between the government on one side and the RBI on the other, uh, which, is being uh, which is being heard by the Allahabad High Court, where yesterday I think the R Allahabad High Court said, well, you know, and, and this is specifically, by the way, in the, in, in the context of the power sector. So there's a bunch of different companies in the power sector, total credit, uh, total amount of debt over there is, I think, two and a half lakh crores. So reasonably a huge amount. Um, and I think what the RB, what the gov what the, what the Allahabad High Court said is there is a provision in the RBI Act which allows the government to give special directions okay. in consultation with the RBI. Uh, this is a power that has never been used before. Um, it effectively allows the government to override the RBI. Uh, the language is not super clear on that, but that's effectively the intent. It's never been used before. It's being viewed as a nuclear option. And I think to some extent what the RBI does next in terms of, you know, goading the banks into pushing cases into the IBC right. will also kind of might depend upon what happens as far as this particular issue is concerned. It's a sub-issue. It doesn't directly sort of, uh, you know, speak to the point that you were raising, uh, Ranjani. But that said, uh, I think probably if, if the direction under Fair 12th is followed through right. and all companies with exposure over 2,000 crores are basically dragged through the IBC process, I think, you know, maybe not much more needs to be done. I think that itself is going to be a huge caseload uh, for the market to handle. I'm not sure there's enough um, bandwidth, enough manpower to actually be able to handle all of that at the same time. But let's assume that that happens and these cases do go through the IBC. I don't know how much more is really required. The rest of it, I think, can be dealt with even outside of the IBC. 
But can you tell us a little bit about the Section 7 uh, that uh, the government is… Well, not a whole lot more <laughs> and I hope it doesn't come to play because I think it just basically, um, you know, I, I think it creates uh, questions in terms of the independence of the RBI, the ability of the government because, you know, once you use a section that's never been used before, the temptation to use it again is, is very strong and very high. And then where do you draw the line, right? I think it's very important. Uh, from our country's perspective and just given the kinds of governors that we have had historically, the RBI has always been a very strong, a very independent regulator. I don't think it's in the interest of generally the financial sector to, you know, to see that the RBI is being overridden by the government. Um, and maybe there can be justification for it as far as the power assets are concerned just because it's power, because the government believes that, you know, uh, the problems in the power sector is, 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 you know, is not really due to bad behavior on the part of promoters, but rather due to certain policy decisions which kind of fall within the government's uh, domain rather than, you know, the power producer's domain. These are not easy points to admit. Uh, but I think it's important, if this section is ever used, to build that kind of a narrative around it. Um, only to make it clear that, you know, it is an exceptional, rarest of the rare kind of a situation and not something that's going to happen on an ongoing basis. Um, so, like I said, I mean, I think there are, uh, there are issues with uh, using this section. Um, I don't think anybody is actually taking it very lightly, as, as they should not. Uh, but for those reasons that I just mentioned, I, I hope it doesn't end up getting invoked. Uh, you know, I also want to bring in uh, the project Sashak, uh, proposal. Um, where do you see that going and ha how much of the work I mean, we are told that the work has started and the AMCs have to, you know, be formed now. What is the general feedback that you're getting from uh, 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 Mixed, I'd say mixed. So, look, I think the project Sashak, first of all, is a multi-pronged approach. Um, so, one part of it is, as you're rightly saying, Ranjani, the setting up of an AMC with a dedicated vehicle which will aggregate bad debt, raise money from investors, have professionally, uh, have a professional team that will then manage the turnaround of those assets. Uh, largely, I think, being driven by um, a concern on the, bank, on the part of banks that they don't want to get rid of assets altogether at too cheap a value. So the banks will continue to retain, let's say, like a 50%, something south of 50% uh, interest in the asset, so that at least the upside on that uh, asset value, they can ride that at least as far as 50% is concerned, they let go of 50% at a discount. I think that's overall the approach as far as the AMC, AIF uh, construct is concerned. Project Sashak also has an, uh, an intercreditor agreement, uh, which also has received a certain amount of press attention. Um, that, uh, my information is, I think, at least all of the public sector banks have definitely signed it. A few large private sector banks have also signed it. And the people that have not signed it are the smaller pri private sector banks and the foreign banks. Um, and then, you know, a lot of criticism again is leveled against Project Sashak, the ICA part, just because, you know, they haven't been able to achieve signing by all banks. However, uh, even if only the public sector banks have signed it, that itself is a huge step because what that, allows, uh, what that allows is for one public sector bank to take a decision that then binds all of the rest of the public sector banks. And historically, the problem has been that, you know, a, one public sector bank with a small amount of debt outstanding would refuse to sign papers in spite of RBI directions being in place, which says that, well, if 75% have agreed or 66% have agreed, then all of the banks are bound by it. They'd be bound by it. They'd accept they'd be bound by it. But they'd say, you know what, no one can compel me to sign it. And if the RBI wants me to sign it, let them come here and tell me I have to sign a piece of paper. And I think that, in part, is the kind of background that basically led to the RBI also releasing a circular like uh, Feb 12th. They literally withdrew every single scheme that they put out over the last four years in terms of resolution of assets because they said this is simply not working. We had done all of this to enable things for banks, but the banks are determined to create problems as far as they themselves are concerned. Now they can deal with the consequences. Uh, so I think there was a little bit of a, a, a reaction sort of uh, from the RBI as well. Uh, but just in terms of um, uh, what it achieves, I think just the signing by public sector banks alone, assume that's all that happens, itself is a huge step. Um, and I think, you know, so to that extent, I think there's a lot of benefit for the project Sashak ICA alone. The AMC and the asset management uh, uh, idea, I think, is a good one again. Um, on paper, it looks great. Uh, it's got all of the ingredients that are required for it to basically succeed. It enables the inflow of foreign credit, which ultimately is what we need to resolve the NPA situation. Look, it's not going to get resolved without more capital, 
right? Uh, th there is no capital available domestically, I think we can all agree on that. So if there is no capital domestic available domestically, the only place it can flow in from is from outside of India. Right. Setting up a platform that has legitimacy, that can be demonstrated to have the expertise uh, required in order to resolve uh, uh, bad debt, in order to turn around the kinds of assets that are placed in, and the selection of the right kinds of assets, I think is a nice set of ingredients to, to move forward on. So, I mean, are we seeing, uh, you know, few years down the line, will we see more of a AMC AIF resolutions as opposed to the NCLT? Well, I'm hoping a few years down the line we'll see better credit discipline, frankly, um, and with less of these kinds of problems arising in the first place. Um, I think, as I said, uh, you know, as we were talking about the bigger role that NBFCs might be expected to play in terms of credit disbursement. Um, if that happens in the right way, if things move in the right direction, I think one big advantage, hopefully, will be that, you know, you just don't have these kinds of situations where uh, money is given on the basis of a phone call from the Ministry of Finance. I mean, you know, everybody has heard uh, these kinds of allegations. Uh, public sector banks are lent on to lend to other public sector enterprises uh, simply because nobody else will. Hopefully, all of that will kind of come down significantly. There's more accountability in terms of loan disbursements and then recollections. It doesn't become somebody else's problem. You know, it's not as if every uh, lending institution will have a SAMG or a stress assets group whose job it then becomes to clean up the mess that others have created. There is personal accountability for, you know, loans that are disbursed. Things are run in a more professional manner. Then hopefully this shouldn't be a problem that we're talking about in a few years' time. It'll all be about cleaning up legacy, but then, you know, uh, going forward, uh, doing things in a more disciplined manner so that they just avoid these problems. And, and do you think some capacity building needs to be done for... Resolution uh, for the resolution of bad debt, yes. I mean, I think, well, as I was saying, uh, you know, with a huge storm of cases that are set to hit uh, the IBC process, I just don't think there's enough manpower, not on the side of law firms, uh, I can speak for myself first, uh, but then I don't think it's there on the side of banks, it's not there uh, as far as resolution professionals currently are concerned, and, you know, finally the NCLTs. I don't think there's enough manpower to deal with uh, the kinds of problems that are going to come. Because, you know, once you start dealing with these sorts of cases, you realize how, how to what extent each case is so different from the other, right. to what extent each case has problems that are very unique to itself, uh, which means that, you know, each case needs time devoted to it. You don't really have the ability to take a broom and, like, you know, sort of sweep a whole bunch of cases with the same kind of an approach. It doesn't work. Um, in each case, there'll be different kinds of motivations, different kinds of stakeholders, potentially different kinds of challenges based on different kinds of decisions that have been taken. Uh, I do see that, you know, there is likely to be a little bit of shortage of manpower, at least in the short term. Uh, I think there are certain initiatives that are uh, being undertaken to address this. So, for example, the IBBI, as I understand it, um, which is the regulator for the IBC for all practical purposes. The IBBI is planning, so right now the test to become a resolution professional is a multiple choice test that you do, it's fairly simple. Uh, you can knock it off in a few minutes. But as I understand it, they're planning to introduce a graduate program uh, which will basically provide intensive training in relation to the IBC. Uh, a big basis for that training will be all of the experience that has already been garnered. Uh, you don't want to lose that experience, you want to use it towards basically, you know, improving the future. Um, and if it's a graduate program, then you have licensed professionals, you have apprentices, you know, it, it works just like any other professional qualification works. Um, and then creates a new breed of professionals. So while on one hand, I'm hoping that, you know, there'll be less and less of a need for these kinds of professionals, and the reality is, you know, NPAs will happen at any point of time. We just hope that they don't happen altogether at such scale. Uh, but yes, in terms of capacity building, I think a lot needs to be done, and I think the first steps are already being taken as well. Okay. Thank you so much, Ashwin. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ranjani. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot.